Yay. Yay. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the fifth monthly installment of our virtual star parties brought to you by the Riverside Astronomical Society in collaboration with the University of California, Riverside's Department of Physics and Astronomy. So my, my name is John and I will be one of your co-hosts tonight. I'm the director of the outreach program for the Riverside Astronomical Society. I am not an astronomer, certainly in any formal sense of the word. I have had no formal training, but I like astronomy and I've liked it for a long time. So I'm happy to be here with you tonight. Sunan? Thank you, John, and good evening, everyone. My name is Sunan Du, and I am in charge of uh, education and public outreach in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UC Riverside. My background is in astronomy, and I got my uh, PhD in astronomy a couple of years ago. Specifically, I study galaxies that are really, really far away from the Milky Way. Um, it is a great pleasure, and I think it's been a very successful collaboration uh, with the Riverside Astronomical Society. And I can't believe this is already our fifth session for uh, the virtual stargazing party. How time flies. So um, yeah, I guess today we're very excited uh, to bring you a discussion uh, specifically focusing on binocular astronomy. Um, we will be discussing what we can uh, see in the sky with the binoculars and what advantages binoculars and of course also telescopes and naked eye half. Great. Okay, so tonight we're going to learn the difference between constellations and asterisms. My guess is most of you have never even heard of asterisms, but you know at least one asterism by heart. So we'll be talking about what are those, what's the difference, and of course we'll be looking through our telescopes at five different targets in five different areas of the sky. Um, we're going to be trying simulating kind of the view through the telescope what it would look like if you were actually using binoculars. We'll have to see how well that works. Um, but one of the things you wanna to do tonight, if at all possible, if it's not too late, if you're watching us on a phone with a little screen, you might wanna see if you can upgrade to a tablet or maybe a computer screen or computer monitor, maybe even a television. The bigger the screen, the better you're gonna to enjoy tonight's show. Great, and uh, next I will be introducing our lovely volunteers uh, tonight with us who will be helping out with the live chat you can see on the right hand side. So we welcome all kinds of questions and discussions in there. And if you have any questions, simply just type in there and someone will answer you. So all our chat moderators are graduate students uh, that are very experienced and also passionate about uh, astronomy. Uh, and I will let them to introduce themselves uh, just a little bit. So they are Garrett Lopez. Hello, everyone. Hope you enjoy the show tonight. Uh, Jess Dopel. Hey. Yung Da Ju. Hi, everyone. Uh, Franco Iglesias. Hey, everybody. Hope you enjoy the show. Ning Feng Ho. Hello. Uh, Rudy Garcia. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here. And finally, Cheryl Wilcox. Hey, everybody. Uh, Sh Cheryl is a member of the RAS, and uh, she is also a, a science teacher. So I guess with that, um, I will be uh, just quickly talking about um, you know, the kind of uh, expectations that, that we are having for this show. Um, we are welcoming um, all kinds of questions and discussions, as I mentioned before. And shortly after this show, uh, we will also be sending out a survey form for you to fill out. We wanted to know um, what we do well and maybe not, not so well. Um, so in that case, we are improving based on your needs and preference. So without further ado, um, I'm giving the stage back to John. All right, so now we're going to do something a little different. If you've been with us in prior months, this won't be expected. We're going to tell you a story, an ancient story, one that has been enshrined in the stars. Yeah, so I guess I will be uh, sharing my screen. Just a second. A story that has been enshrined in the stars. Yeah, okay. Finally, <laughs> I pulled up my slides. Okay, um, great. So once upon a time uh, in the mythical seaside kingdom of Ethiopia, 
there lived a beautiful queen, Cassiopeia, and her husband, um, Cepheus. They had a great daughter, very uh, beautiful princess called Andromeda. Now, Cassiopeia, she was indeed beautiful. So much so that she boasted she was more beautiful than the sea nymphs. Now, when the sea nymphs heard of her boastfulness, they were furious and they appeared, appealed to Poseidon, the god of the sea, to wreak havoc on Ethiopia in vengeance over Cassiopeia. So, Poseidon released the monstrous whale known as Cetus to go and attack the kingdom of Ethiopia. Well, the people of Ethiopia were really helpless as the Cetus attacked their kingdom. Eventually, the desperate king and queen learned that the only way to save the kingdom is, uh, from the whale was to sacrifice their only child, Andromeda, to the sea monster. So with great sadness, they chained Andromeda to a large rock on the edge of the sea and waited for Cetus to come for her. Now, meanwhile, a young man named Perseus was flying home on top of his winged horse, Pegasus. Now, Perseus had just defeated a deadly creature known as Medusa, who had snakes for hair. Now, the amazing thing about this was that any living thing that looked, looked Medusa in the eye was immediately turned to stone. So Perseus defeated Medusa by cutting off her head. He then decided to keep her head for a souvenir and bring it home with him by putting it safely in a sack. When Perseus and Pegasus were flying over uh, Ethiopia, Perseus looked down and saw Andromeda chained to the rock and the sea monster fast approaching. Perseus swooped down to rescue Andromeda by removing Medusa's head from the sack and holding it up to Cetus to see. Once the sea monster gazed upon the head, it was immediately turned into stone. And that way, Perseus saved both Princess Andromeda and the kingdom of Ethiopia from the monster's whale. So John, I guess now you're gonna tell us something about the constellations. That's right. Now this story, has more than, well, has six different constellations up in the sky dedicated just to this story. No other story not, has anything remotely like that. So this is an important story that has been carried on for, for thousands of years. Well, more than a thousand years. So let's go up in the sky and see where all these characters are up in the stars. So probably the easiest one to find is Cassiopeia herself, the one that started it all and with her vanity. So you'll see a W shape up in the north sky. And that is Cassiopeia. That's actually kind of her throne where she sits back and gazes at herself in the mirror because she's so beautiful. So here we have the constellation Cassiopeia. And of course, right next to Cassiopeia is her husband, the king, Cepheus. And they have their beautiful daughter Andromeda right here. And then Perseus, the hero, down here. And if we go a little bit farther this way, we'll see Pegasus. The great winged horse is here. So we have a bunch of them, a bunch of the creatures and the characters there. And then we can't forget, of course, the monster. So if we go looking down over here, let's see if I can find him. We have Cetus, the monstrous whale, right here. So six different constellations, right? So let's take a look at what Cetus might have looked like. Oops. With these drawings. So here, Cetus is portrayed more like a, like a monster than a whale. So it kind of depends on where you look. Here, You see hold on, sorry about that. So here we see Perseus, 
And I don't know if you could see this at home or not, but Perseus actually has Medusa's head hanging down at his sides with the snakes and everything. And way up on the top here, we have Andrew with a Cassiopeia. And again, I don't know if you can see this or not, but she's holding up a mirror and gazing upon herself in the mirror. Truly a vain queen. Anyway, so there's a lot of, there's a, a um, six, like I said, six different constellations up there. This is what you might think of as, as naked eye astronomy. For the first oh, couple thousand years of astronomy, there weren't any telescopes, there weren't binoculars. Every scientist or astronomers would lose their eyes and look up at the sky, make charts, make maps, follow the motions of stars and make up stories. So with that, we'll kind of turn it over to Sanan, who will tell us more about the relative benefits of naked eyes versus binoculars versus telescopes. Take it away, Sanan. Thank you very much, Sean. And uh, today I will be um, doing a quick comparison among telescopes, binoculars, and naked eye in terms of stargazing. So I guess a very popular question uh, that we always receive uh, is which one is the best or uh, what equipment should I use for stargazing? Um, and I guess a simple answer to that is it depends because there are several factors that you may want to consider before deciding on one equipment. So um, we are go going to get through all of these different factors, but uh, that sort of depends on the brightness of the target that you're looking at, um, how large of a, a portion of the sky that you want to see at once, um, what kind of details that you want to see the target, um, and also, of course, your budget. So uh, starting from uh, the brightness of the target, well, either we're dealing with naked eye, binoculars, or telescopes, one thing we need to know is that the larger uh, the light collecting area is, um, the more efficient it is in capturing light. So in that way, it's enable you uh, to see fainter objects. So in that case, the, the lens or the aperture of our naked eye is just the pupil, right? Um, and that is much smaller than the binocular lens. Uh, and the binocular lenses are much smaller compared to telescope mirrors. So binoculars can actually see about 40 to 60 times fainter than naked eye. Um, and an amateur telescope, um, you'd be surprised, that can see uh, about 10 to 50 times fainter than binoculars. So if you have very good eyesight uh, during the night, this is what you would see in the sky um, for Pleiades. However, if you have a pair of binoculars, this is sort of what you would get in, in uh, using a pair of binoculars. And you can see that the image is not only getting larger, but it's also becoming brighter, so easier for you to see. And another factor that we want to consider is the field of view. Um, and that sort of uh, uh, measures how much of sky, what portions of the sky that you can see at once. So for example, if I'm only having a field of view of half of a degree um, and I'm focusing on the galaxy, then with half of a degree, I can only see the center of this galaxy. And if I'm expanding it, increasing it to one degree, I can see half of the galaxy. And if I'm going further um, outwards uh, to one and a half degrees, then I can see pretty much the entire galaxy. But now there's the question as to, okay, well, I know typically we measure, we talk about size in terms of, you know, meters or at least length. Uh, why are we talking about degrees here? Well, so this is what we call uh, the angular size uh, of uh, the objects in the sky. And now I want you to all follow me to extend your arm as much as you can. So um, once at one arm length, your feast is actually about um, 10 degrees, um, it spans about 10 degrees in width in the sky, okay? And uh, one pinky would uh, expand about one to two degrees. And if you expand, uh, extend your thumb and pinky this way and try to measure, that's about uh, 25 degrees and you should be able, to, well, that, that should be the roughly, well, rough size about um, uh, of the Big Dipper. 
So coming back to uh, the field of view concept, um, of course, our naked eye can see almost everything at once. So 180 degrees uh, vertically and uh, about 135 degrees um, horizontally. But for binoculars, uh, the patch of sky that we're able to see is only about six to eight degrees. And telescopes, um, they can see even smaller areas that's typically below two degrees. Um, so it all depends on what you wanna see. For example, if you wanna uh, catch a meteor, um, naked eye would definitely be the, the best to use because you don't know where a meteor would be coming from. And actually, uh, just a little plug, um, we will be expecting the Leonid meteor shower next week and it's gonna be last uh, for about five days. So if you have time, then make sure to step out and uh, see what's up in the sky. And finally, uh, the factor we, we need to consider is the resolution uh, of the image, which we could uh, think about as the level of details that you want to get. And the larger the lens, the higher the image resolution. So an example would be Jupiter. If you're only looking up into the sky or like trying to take pictures with your cell phone, this is what you get, um, an image of Jupiter. But if you happen to have an amateur telescope, this might be what you see in the eyepiece. You can see the, the bands there, and maybe you can also capture you know, one or a few of the, the Jovian moons. But if we're using one of the largest telescopes on Earth to uh, observe the same target, this is from the Gemini Telescope in Hawaii, and you can see all these fantastic details of this planet. So just to sum up, um, what should I use? Well, it depends on what kind of targets you have in mind and you wanna observe. So for naked eye, it enables the widest field of view and you can look at large patches of the sky at one time. So they would be good for constellations, asterisms, uh, meteor showers, et cetera. And of course that is free. And for binoculars, uh, it offers a really nice balance between uh, the field of view and also uh, the details um, of the naked eye gems. So they would be good for uh, star clusters, nebulae, comets, um, some smaller asterisms, and Andromeda or other galaxies, if you could see it. Um, it could be, depending on what kind of binoculars you're getting, it could be pretty cheap um, or it could be a little bit more expensive. And finally, for telescopes, it is good for getting very sharp, uh, well-defined image for very small objects. So you don't wanna use telescopes to see like a very extended, like big object, say like the Big Dipper, because you would not be able to capture everything in your field of view. So they would be good to um, look at uh, planets, the planet's moons, um, the star clusters, et cetera. And of course, if you wanna do astrophotography, where you wanna image those targets uh, with special filters. Like if you look at the sun and want to see like a specific color, the hydrogen emits, then you wanna use telescopes. And again, depending on what kind of telescope you're getting, uh, you could be, it could be pretty cheap or it could be extremely expensive if you wanna do like professional astronomy. So yeah, that's everything from me, John. All right, so. Binoculars, here is a pair of my binoculars. I can use these for football games. I can use these for hiking or backpacking. They're nice and small, easy to store. The problem is these are not gonna be very good for looking at the nighttime sky. The lens here on the front called the objective lens, which you know, the skyward lens, this is 21 millimeters, which is a lot better than your eyeball. The pupil may be six millimeters, but it's not very big in terms of bringing in dark distant things. So these binoculars, they're fine for daytime stuff, but I would not use these at night. These puppies, these are the ones I would use at night. Here we have binoculars with the 50 millimeter lens at the end. The skyward lens is 50 millimeters, which is plenty big for seeing some pretty cool stuff. Much bigger than that, and they get to be pretty heavy and you really can't even hold them. This binocular magnifies things by 10 times. So you could call these binoculars 10 by 50s, right? 10 times magnification. So it makes things look 10 times bigger than they would to your naked eye. And they have 50 millimeters of aperture on the objective lens, which lets a lot of light in. 
So these kind of binoculars, I mean, you can spend a lot of money on these, right? But you can go to Big Five or Amazon, you can get a 10 by 50 pair of binoculars for like $40, um, which would be a great starting set for you. So not very expensive unless you want to spend a lot of money, then you can. All right, so do we have any questions yet at this point in our chat room that to be talking about in terms of binoculars or telescopes or naked eye or the clash of the titans? Not yet, but no? I'll report back when there is. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so I mentioned the clash of the titans, that story that we talked to you about earlier with Perseus and Andromeda and such. You may, that may seem familiar to you if you have seen the movie, The Clash of the Titans, originally made in 1980, 81, something like that, and then remade in 2010, so. If you haven't seen it, you might want to check it out and get the story again. Anyway, we are going to go back out to the sky now. We're going to go to Perseus. Remember the great hero with Medusa's head hanging from his hand? Well, right in that general neighborhood of the sky, Randy's going to show us not one, but two clusters of stars. So, Randy, go for it. Okay, let me go ahead and uh, share screen here and get this going. Okay, can you see this screen here of, um, of mine? Yes. Okay. Um, it's actually very easy to find. It's a double uh, open cluster, and, and uh, I'll get to what an open cluster here is in a minute. But if you can find Cassiope over here, the queen, and the hero, uh, Perseus, which will be off uh, at this time of night, uh, actually below Cassiopeia, you take these two stars here in Cassiopeia, Navi and uh, Rachba, I don't know how you say that exactly, and follow, they make a line, and it goes about uh, a little further than this distance here, and goes straight down to the great double cluster. Now you might say, why are there two of them? Well, actually, because I guess they knew if they didn't put two uh, open clusters here, that uh, Perseus and his mother-in-law, Cassiopeia, would probably end up fighting over it. So they put two, so each one could have one. Let me go on to the next picture. If you are in the city lights like Riverside, I don't mean downtown Riverside, but just about kind of the average neighborhood in, in Inland Empire, and through binoculars, and you don't have a, a grocery store right next to you, you'll probably see something like this. You'll see two distinct groups of stars here and here. These open clusters are a loose um, grouping of stars. Uh, they're generally stars that were born uh, at the same time out of a uh, cloud of gas and dust. They're roughly the same age. And uh, through time, uh, they will disperse into the throughout the uh, uh, arm of the galaxy. When you're looking at uh, the great double cluster, we're actually looking through our own Orion arm and looking into the next arm out called the Perseus arm. So these are, um, they're both uh, fairly close together to each other and are actually kind of coming our way at about 15 miles per, uh, per second. But considering that they're probably something like 7,600 light years away, it's gonna take a long time for them to get anywhere near us. If you were to take these and bring them in as close as, for example, the uh, Pleiades, they would be the brightest stars in our sky by far. And it would, they, these, each one of these would take up about the size of um, a quarter of the northern hemisphere of our sky. It'd be huge. Um, if we were to go to a better uh, deep sky site, and again, we're trying to simulate um, here we go, simulate what you look through binoculars is probably slightly larger here than what you get in a binoculars. But uh, uh, Cheryl, our moderator, took this picture in a dark sky site on the desert. Um, and you can see, of course, a lot more stars around. You can see the two groupings very distinctly. And even better yet, if you were to go and uh, spend about $10,000 worth of uh, 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 telescopes and uh, good uh, uh, color cameras and all that, you can take a picture like this one of the 
believe it was used in astronomy picture of the day and get uh, uh, the double cluster up even closer. The uh, lore of this, this has actually been seen as far back as uh, Hipparchus, uh, the ancient Greeks in uh, 130 BC and has been seen since then. It was actually considered the jewel handle of Perseus's sword. With that, I think I'll turn it back over. Thank you, Randy. Terrific. So we're gonna stay outside looking up at the sky. And this time we're gonna go by Andromeda. Remember the, the beautiful princess chained to the rock? And there she is right in the middle of the screen. And if we turn off these kind of distracting images here, and then we take a look at Andromeda, she's right over here, right? And right next to Andromeda is Pegasus, the winged horse. The two of them are right next to each other in the sky. And I usually use that square that you see in Pegasus to help me find Andromeda in the sky. Anyway, right over here within Andromeda, is the Andromeda galaxy, not part of the Milky Way galaxy, but another galaxy altogether. And Manny is gonna tell us all about that. Manny? Thank you, John. Uh, uh, my name is Manny Lyons. I'm here uh, coming to you from beautiful Mariposa, California. I'm sitting in my observatory and my, uh, my telescope is right back here. And we'll be showing you a, a telescopic view of uh, Andromeda here momentarily. But uh, in the meantime, let me show you my screen and let's talk about naked eye and, um, and binocular views of the Andromeda galaxy. Now, um, I should point out, as John just mentioned, where you can find Andromeda in the sky. If you are fortunate enough to go to somewhere where the sky is dark, um, you can, in fact, see the Andromeda galaxy with your naked eye. And uh, this is something that I, I do a lot of outreach with, uh, with groups such as the Boy Scouts. And this is one of the things that uh, I love to share with the Scouts is when you go out under the sky and you look at the Andromeda galaxy and you see that little tiny smudge, you may have to use what's called averted vision and look slightly to the side. But when you see it, uh, you are seeing light, photons that are hitting your eye that left the Andromeda galaxy two and a half million years ago before there were any humans uh, on Earth. And I, that's just kind of a, that kind of gets me tingly every time uh, I think about that. And uh, so anyway, I would encourage everyone to go out and see that little smudge uh, with the naked eye. And when you see it with the naked eye, that makes it a whole lot easier to turn your binoculars onto it afterward. And so uh, here on my slide is a, a, this is a simulated view of what the Andromeda galaxy might look like through, uh, through uh, 10 by 50 binoculars. And um, I, think that is, I think that's a typo, it should actually be seven by 50. But in any event, uh, here's what it looks like. And so if you do get out there uh, with binoculars and even in, uh, in the suburbs, you should be able to see that smudge and make out at least the elongated uh, elliptical shape and the brighter glow of the nucleus. Uh, there's also a dust lane here, which we're, we're gonna see uh, in a moment when I show, the, show you the telescopic view. Um, uh, that there's a little bit of a drop off on the light on one side to the northwest here, which is, which is the dust lane. But then uh, if you are at a darker site, you uh, have the opportunity to see some more details. And uh, in particular, you actually get three galaxies for the price of one, because there are two others, uh, Messier 32 here, uh, Andromeda is called at Messier 31. Uh, the, the satellite or companion galaxy, uh, Messier 32, and Messier 110 over here as well, all in the same binocular field of view. These are going to look like little fuzzy stars, but um, but uh, you can uh, you can tell all your friends that you saw three galaxies in one uh, binocular view. There, and these are all part of our local group of galaxies. They are close to the to the Milky Way. Uh, as a matter of fact we uh, are potentially going to uh, 
merge with the Andromeda galaxy in about, uh, oh, four billion years or so. So, uh, you know, mark your calendar for that one. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy, uh, we used to think that it was larger than uh, the Milky Way. It's actually the latest uh, information suggests it's probably around the same size, around a trillion solar masses. That's, uh, that's a lot of stars. And, um, uh, and, uh, and it's about 200,000 light years across. So roughly the same size as our, as our Milky Way galaxy. So let me uh, change my screen here. And with any luck, there we go. Uh, this is a live, almost live view of the Andromeda galaxy. So I'm going to take a, take a big chance here and hit refresh. Um, let me let me go ahead and clear that. And so every 15 seconds, a new image comes in. And that one happened to already be capturing uh, when I click clear. But so here is the Andromeda galaxy. And you can see the dust lane we were talking about earlier. And uh, you can see here Messier 32, the, uh, the one of the companion galaxies, and Messier 110 over here, all three of them. And so we're uh, we're capturing frames here and in another few seconds another one will come in and that that is just going to make the uh, this less noisy and, and look a little bit a little bit clearer but you can see these vast dust lanes and uh, if my camera had a little bit better color sensitivity we would see pink regions here where uh, where stars are are being formed so uh, that is a live view uh, through the telescope behind me of the uh, of the Andromeda galaxy so now if I were to have yet uh, uh, even a better telescope or a little bit more uh, time, this is what uh, we would see. So this is uh, an astronomy picture of the day. Uh, I highly uh, recommend you check out uh, APOD on the internet. Uh, there's a, a beautiful uh, picture every day with some uh, wonderful description about astronomical sites. But here, we can see these pink areas where the star, where we have star forming regions, very much like our own uh, uh, Milky Way galaxy. And here, of course, we see the the other two, uh, the other two companion galaxies as well. So, uh, speaking of an um, astronomy picture of the day, before I get off the stage, I want to show you today's astronomy picture of the day. And uh, we digress here because this does not uh, have anything to do with uh, the, the, the story that uh, John and Sinan just told, but uh, it is very topical. Here, you may recognize uh, the three stars of Orion's belt. And right here is uh, the Orion Nebula. So this is kind of upside down, but here's the Orion Nebula. Here are a couple of others, the, the horse head, if you're familiar, but right over here is something strange. This little sea green blob. This is Comet Atlas. And uh, it is uh, going to reach its closest approach to the Earth, I believe on Saturday, in just a couple of days. And so if you have the opportunity to go out to a dark site, and you have a good pair of uh, those 10 by 50 binoculars, and uh, maybe a small telescope, go check it out. You should be able to see this little, this little fuzzball. And uh, if, you, if you Google uh, Comet Atlas, you'll find, uh, have some finder charts. It's marching along, so it won't be right here uh, near the belt in a couple of days. It will have moved. But uh, yeah, go out and check it out. It's, um, I have not yet seen it, but I definitely intend to in the next several days. So with that, I will, uh, I will send it back to John. Thank you, Manny. That was terrific. OK, so now the moment you've all been waiting for. Hold on one second. Manny, could you stop the sharing? I can. Let me, uh, let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Wait, wait. John, by the way, we have some good questions in the chat. Ah, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so one of the questions asked, uh, and that's from uh, Bayou Olotu, um, they are asking a super newbie question. Well, this is, <laughs> all, the, all the questions are, are great. Um, where to start when trying to identify constellations? Yes, and uh, that's a 
great question, not just a newbie question. That's a good question for anyone to pursue. The best way to start is to grab some star charts. And there's many of them that are even available for free online. And I know, John, you're going to talk about some astronomy resources at the end. Yes. One of the things to remember when you're learning the constellations, don't bother or worry about trying to match them with the name or the drawing of the constellation. Start by looking at the chart and find the main or brightest stars in that constellation and practice looking around and finding them. And it's important to go out at different, definitely different times of the night and seasons because you'll notice how the sky changes. And then practice, look at your chart, then look up at the sky, try to find the brightest star. And remember the darker the sky, the more stars in the constellation you'll be able to see. And then be sure to keep it up. Don't just do it one night. You need to go out very, very often. And that's where binoculars come in very handy, by the way. Star charts will often show you binocular objects, and that helps you practice finding those brighter objects in relation to the constellation as you practice looking around the night sky. I'd just like to add one thing to that. Not all constellations are created equally. Right. Some are right. big and bright and easy to find. Others, I've never found them and I don't think I ever will. Um, so you focus on the easier ones to find at first. That's my suggestion. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you, John. Um, and Chelsea Simpson asked, how do you know how old a star is? Um, I'd like to answer that question if I could, and I'm going to do that by reminding you that, um, well, how do you know how old a person is? Because when you look at a person, they're sitting there going, wah, 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 wah. That's a baby. Or they're sitting there looking like this. That's an old man. Now, how did you know that? You knew that because you've seen lots of babies and you've seen lots of old men. And let me share my screen for a second here, if I could. And over on the, this side of the screen, you'll see um, uh, some astronomers have taken some time to uh, illustrate all of the different uh, types of stars that there could be. And stars are characterized by their sizes and by their colors and uh, some are very small white dwarfs and some are big, some are super giants. And if you look at enough of these in enough time, you'll realize that they represent, among other things, they, they represent a lot of stuff, but they represent, among other things, the age of the star, the different parts of a life cycle of a star. For instance, our sun is on the main sequence here. And if you were here with us a couple of uh, 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 outreaches ago, you know that eventually our star is going to get old and it's going to grow up into a big super giant star. Now, how long does it take to grow into that giant star? Well, it depends on how long it takes to burn all its fuel. And when it's burned its hydrogen fuel into helium, well, then it will start to expand into this red giant space. And the same kinds of things can be said for all the different kinds of stars. And science can calculate by the size of a given star, how much hydrogen it's got, and they know how long the reactions take for something to happen. And they can calculate from that approximately how long it's going to be until the star gets older into its next stage. So by looking at a lot of different stars, just like looking at a bunch of different people, you will eventually learn what little ones look like and what older ones look like. And that's, that's the easy answer that you can do in a minute and a half. There's more to it, as you will find out when you get your degree in physics. There's another question in there. Oh, about, Alex, um, yes. I, I think that, that already got answered. But, but yeah, but thank you. So we're going to move on. Distance to stars was answered? OK. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then I'm finished. Stop sharing. Thank you. And uh, giving it back to you, John. All right, terrific. Now we're going to go back outside and look up at the stars. And now the moment you've been waiting for where you finally will get to learn the difference between a constellation and an asterism. You're going to learn what it is an asterism, right? So we're going to go back up and now we're going to look at Pegasus once again. 
we've talked about Pegasus, the winged horse that, and the way I find it is I look for this square up in the sky. There's no other place in the sky where you see a great big square like this. That is known as the great square of Pegasus, right? It is not the constellation of Pegasus. We scroll down around here, the constellation of Pegasus is this great big thing here. Only part of that constellation is the great square. So the constellation is all the stars within a group. And an asterism is a smaller group of stars within that group that has some sort of an interesting shape, something that makes it kind of interesting to stand out, easy to see. So the great square of Pegasus is one. Let's look for one more aster uh, asterism. And here we're gonna look in the Northern sky and I'm gonna, pay, I'm gonna advance through time here. I'm gonna go till probably let's say three o'clock in the morning. So tomorrow, tomorrow morning or tonight at three in the morning, if you go outside and look in the Northeast, you will see the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper, right? It's got this bowl, right? You've recognized the bowl and the stars. And it has a handle, it goes out like this, then it takes a bend over this way. That is the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is not a constellation. For that, we've got to look at a much larger group of stars and for that, we're calling Ursa Major. This great big thing here, the Great Bear, Ursa Major. I never see a bear when I look up there. What I see is the asterism of the Big Dipper. Most, much of the other world calls it the plow, like farmers you know, using a plow out in the field. Here in America, we call it the Big Dipper. It is a subgroup of stars within a larger constellation of Ursa Major. That is an asterism. These were a couple asterisms that um, you could see easily, naked eye. They're big, right? One little bonus thing that we'll talk about, that if you're back here at the, at the Big Dipper, you're following the handle down, all of a sudden the handle takes a bend or it turns. Right at that spot where it turns is a star called Mizar. So when you go have your binoculars, you go out there and take a look for the Big Dipper, look at that place where the, where the handle bends and look there with your binoculars and see that one star is actually a couple stars. That is known as a binary star system. And pretty soon Jose is going to talk to us more about that. So, um, so with that, we're going to look at a couple more cool things up in the sky that we're going to show you how they would look through binoculars. And the first thing we're going to look at, we're going to go over here. to the eastern sky. Oops, I forgot. I was living in the future. Okay, going back to regular time. We're gonna look for the constellation called Taurus the Bull. And one thing you could do is you see We've talked a little bit earlier when Randy was, or when Manny was talking about the comet Atlas and referencing Orion's belt, which is right down here. And Orion's belt points up, 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 up into the constellation of Taurus the bull to a group of stars that again, you can see with your naked eye. A lot of people see this and they think, ah, there's the Little Dipper. It's not the Little Dipper, it is the Pleiades. Perhaps the most beautiful thing you can see in the night sky with binoculars. So with that, I'm going to ask Brian to take it away. Yes, thanks, John. Go ahead and share my screen here. So Pleiades is also an asterism. Here's a live view of the Pleiades. So this is with a, a Canon D3400 SLR camera. And so this is actually a live view. And let me tell you a little bit about the Pleiades. Now, this is actually a Messier object. And by Messier, uh, you may remember that from previous shows, where Messier objects are actually, I'm going to stop my screen for a second. This is by the comet hunter Messier, where he actually hunted lists of objects that could be confused with binoculars. I'm sorry, I apologize, confused with comets. 
And they now are awesome objects to look at, not only with binoculars, but with telescopes also. So my notes just refuse to come up, so I gotta switch screens here. Now, again, with this live view with the Pleiades, this is one of the rare naked eye Messier objects. In other words, you can actually see it without a, any kind of magnification, but using binoculars are, are an awesome way to zoom in a little bit here. This is called an open star cluster. There's about 800 stars and it is 410 light years away. Now, if you put a larger telescope on it, you'll actually start to see some nebulosity. That's a fancy word for cloudy or fuzziness over the stars. This is actually caused by dust, which is reflecting off blue light from these hot B-type stars. So as Alex was talking about earlier, from the color, we can have the sense of the makeup and age of the stars. So these blue hot B-type stars are considered to be rather young. Now, a little bit about the mythology. You may remember from John and Sinan's story about the nymphs that were mentioned. So Pleiades is also called the Seven Sisters. And that name comes th uh, then from seven of the stars plus their parents. So the names for the brightest nine come from Greek mythology. It's the Seven Sisters that are nymphs and their parents, Atlas and Pleione. Now, before I tell you a little bit more, let me show you what would happen if we take a two second image instead of a live view of the camera. This will gather in a little bit more light than we can with our eyes. And you'll notice that with this live image, we can actually start to see that blue color in the stars, plus some other stars in the background. Start to get a sense for how wonderful this object is in the night sky. One last fact, Pleiades is a great test of your eyesight and the seeing conditions. Many people report seeing about five stars naked eye. According to Robert Burnham in his Celestial Handbook, there are about 20 stars at least that can be seen under the finest conditions. So after our show's over, be sure to go out. Uh, ple the Pleiades will be nice and high in the sky and see how many stars you can see when you go out. And I'll pass it back to you, John. Terrific. Oh, uh, we do have some, some good questions. And there's actually a question specifically for Brian uh, yes. from Lori and Paradise Flyer. Uh, Brian, is your camera mounted on your telescope? And what is the size of your telescope? Yes, it is mounted on the telescope. Uh, the, I'm using a regular single lens reflex camera and the lens is about 150 millimeter. It's a zoom adjustable, so it's about where it is. And it's sitting on a five inch refractor telescope. And even with a five inch telescope, that would magnify the Pleiades to a point where I'd only be able to show you a piece of it at a time. So to simulate what it would look like in binoculars, I used my uh, telephoto lens on a camera. Great, thank you. And uh, um, Jacob uh, Abris was asking, um, well, he was curious uh, as to like, what is the most out of the ordinary thing uh, that we've found in the sky? Yeah, I could go ahead and take that one. Go ahead, Randy. Okay. Um, a lot of times when people ask that question, they sort of infer the unknown or unusual. Um, I, I'll give you two real quick, quick answers. One is unusual and one is just doesn't happen very often. The, the most unusual thing, because it doesn't happen as often as one would like and you have to travel to go see them is solar eclipses. Those are awesome. If you ever have never seen the sun disappear behind the moon, you should see one at least sometime in your lifetime. Uh, viewable also, which is pretty nice to see if you've never seen one, is a lunar eclipse. Those are a little bit more viewable uh, because you don't have to travel anywhere with them. There's, they can be very gorgeous. They take a long time, but they're beautiful. Unknown was probably one morning when we were doing a outreach for a local city college and we had a, a lot of visitors out uh, the outskirts of Riverside, and it was during, a, unfortunately, during a Santa Ana's. And um, we saw a bright red object come up over the horizon and was moving around very erratically. And it was kind of funny watching the psychology of the group 
as they were getting all wrapped up is what that could that be? What is that thing and all that? And finally, I couldn't take it anymore. And I, I threw the telescope over on it and said, announced everybody, does anybody want to see a really lousy picture of Mars? Because the wind is blowing it around so much, it's looking like a helicopter going crazy on the horizon. And then everybody sort of uh, uh, laughed about that and came over and, and looked at Mars after that. But that was that was quite an unusual event that happened. Wow. Back to you. What a story. Thank you for sharing, Vinny. Um, and there is another question from, uh, you know, a name that's full of Japanese characters that I cannot pronounce. How do we know the existence of nebulae and what happens in nebulae? Uh, and I can take that. So I guess we typically uh, find nebulae in telescopes because, um, or, I mean, they could also be binoculars, but they would first appear to be very fuzzy. Um, they're not like a point source as a star in the sky. So that sort of drives people to um, try to look further into those targets. And remember, we said that with telescopes, you are able to see more details. And that's uh, when they find out, oh, wow, that is a very extended target in instead of just like one point. Um, so there are different types of uh, nebulae. Uh, one type I would say is the stellar nursery. And if you were here a couple of uh, every sessions ago, we were talking about, you know, those were uh, where the young massive stars were forming and it was very dusty. So um, you would also, you know, like after um, millions and billions of years they would in eventually turn into stars. But currently those are the clouds where the, the stars are forming. Um, there are other types of nebulae where it could either be a planetary nebula or a supernova remnant, and both are sort of like the, the dead uh, stars. Um, so those are like a very hot, um, thin gas uh, that's ejected by the, a massive star um, at the end of their, their life. Um, let's, let's put it that way. So they're like ejecting all their envelopes outside and that spreads into the interstellar space. Um, and that is uh, what we see as nebulae uh, because it's very gaseous and it's indeed gas uh, from a dead or dying star. Okay, so I guess that's it. Uh, giving it back to you, John. All right, awesome. Now we're gonna go high up in the sky near what we call the zenith. And there at the zenith, we will find, I hope we will find, the constellation Cygnus. Now, Cygnus, if you've been with us before, we've talked about Cygnus. Cygnus is a swan, right? And this is one of the few constellations that actually looks like what it's supposed to look like. So Cygnus, a swan, would have a nice long neck, right? Swans have nice big wings on one side, one on the other. Swans have a tail feather. And this particular swan, we're looking at the head, at the end of the long neck, we'll see what is a star called Albireo. And Jose is going to tell us more about Albireo, and we will discover that it is not one star, but two, much like Mizar in the handle of the Big Dipper. Albireo is a binary star system. Take it away, Jose. All right. Um, thank you very much, John. Uh, all right. So like John stated, I'm going to be talking about the binary star system or an optical double. Uh, Albireo is a very interesting uh, system because there is speculation that is it's not uh, uh, gravitationally bound to each other, but uh, that's all for discussion. Anyway, I'm going to be sharing... Uh, first of all, I'm going to be sharing my live view of what Albireo would look like if you're looking through binoculars or a small aperture telescope. Um, and if you're looking at that screen right there, right smack in the center, you're going to see a bright spot. And then you're going to see like a, a flashlight on the side, coming on the side of it. Well, guess what? That is actually the... Um, uh, uh, the binary star Albireo, you have uh, one star that it tends to look uh, brighter or younger, and the other one it tends to be older or fainter. 
Uh, how do you know that? Well, the fainter star, which it tends to be golden or orange, tends to be uh, red shifting or going towards, you know, toward the cooler cycle of its life. And then the younger, brighter star tends to be bluish. Um, if you see all of those red and greens, is because, well, there is a faint uh, veil of uh, clouds above. Uh, and I'm using, uh, using excuse me, uh, high uh, ISO in order for me to pick that up. Now, um, about, I'll say uh, uh, every, every uh, 80%, about 80% of the stars that we have up in the sky are considered to be binary system or at least two star systems. Uh, I heard uh, Alex mentioning one time that our sun is a very peculiar one because it just happens to wander through the universe by itself. But it is a known fact that around 80% or four of every five stars that we can actually uh, see on our uh, known or visible uh, universe are binary star systems. Uh, also, John um, talks about um, a story about Tatooine from the Star Wars movie in the episode four where Lucas uh, Skywalker looks over the horizons and you can actually see two suns over the horizon. Um, that would be a, a good representation visual of what would it be like to live in a, a binary star system. Although reality would dictate a different thing. Why? Well, because if you were in a, a, a binary star system, you were living in one, actually you have a pretty tough time making it through uh, certain times of your existence because the gravitational pull by which these two stars are bound to each other would create a very elongated elliptical uh, orbit of whatever planet might be going uh, uh, around uh, one of the stars. And that can create a little bit of conflict when it comes to be on the longer side away from either one of the stars because then you'll be like out of the habitable zone. Now I'm gonna stop sharing this is a live view right now. That is a live view of the star. And I am going to share, I'm gonna share here. Um, uh, where are you? Show yourself. And I'm gonna show you here what uh, the star looks like if you take a picture of that through that small uh, lens. Remember, it is uh, supposed to be the size of a binocular, so you won't see a spectacular, <clears throat> excuse me, a spectacular image of what it, it looks like, but there you have it. You, have, you can have the definition of two stars. One tends to be bluish, the other one tends to be in the orange side. So, uh, and then you can actually see uh, a lot of other stars around it because like um, it was been uh, talked about before, when you have a bigger field of view, you can see more stars, not just one or two, but you get to see a whole bunch of them and that's what you usually get to see when you look through binoculars. You get to see a lot of stars. You don't get to see a small area of the sky. You get to see a lot more sky, but you also can get to see beautiful things gravitationally pulled or bound to each other like what it is, a binary star system. John? All right. Now... Zanon, you say we have some more questions? Yes, there's a quick question uh, for Manny, I believe. Um, so uh, Alessandro V was curious, uh, where, where does Manny keep his telescope? <laughs> okay, um, kind of quick one. The, um, so I'm here in, uh, in Mariposa, about an hour west of Yosemite, and I'm actually sitting in a very cold, uh, <laughs> observatory because we have the the roof is open right now but um 
Yeah, so so uh, it, it, the telescope, it's an 11 inch uh, Celestron telescope. Uh, it is permanently mounted uh, here in the observatory. And uh, I think I actually have a quick picture of it. Let me just, let me just very quickly share my screen. And uh, this is where I'm sitting. I'm sitting at this desk uh, right here. And uh, this is the telescope. Uh, it's a little bit of an odd arrangement with the camera mounted on the front. This is a special purpose uh, cooled camera as if it's not cold enough in the observatory already. And um, so this is the telescope we're using right now to, uh, to image uh, Andromeda. You can see this was taken during the daytime and uh, the roof is open here. You can just kind of barely see the trees. The roof is slid over here to the side. So little electric motor here uh, opens the roof and closes it um, as needed. So, okay, back to, uh, back to you guys. Thank you, Manny. And uh, another qu uh, quick question. Well, I guess maybe maybe not that quick. Um, is is that? Um, oh, I'm I'm losing it uh, here. Okay, yeah. So today we still have. Uh, do we still name things after Greek and Roman mythology? Are there anything that's named after other cultures? Um, I'd like to answer that if I could, Zenon. Um, first off, though, I would ask that um, um, John, could you start up Stellarium? And then one of the features of Stellarium is that you can change the cultural references. In other words, you can bring up the Chinese constellations, the Persian constellations, the everything constellations. Could you um, see if you could do that real quick and, uh, and while I go on to something else here? Sure. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and while I'm sharing it, you can see that we've got, um, we've got Chinese constellations here. Uh, the boat is right here. This is the boat. And it's also where Perseus is. Here's Cassiopeia. We're talking about Cassiopeia tonight. And uh, in fact, it's a canopy in China. And if we were to go to the Navajos, we could see that we would have bird constellations and ram constellations, mountain lion constellations. And we could we have all these other constellations. In fact, we're talking about the Greek and Roman, uh, and in fact, they weren't Greek and Roman, they were Babylonian before that, uh, Ethiopian, they, they come from all over, but generally it was the Greeks who wrote down the stories in the first place and, and really made them popular, and everybody else has been kind of copying them. And since most of Western science is based on the Greeks and what the Greeks were able to do uh, with their stories, all that follows along. So um, things are still being named. If there's a new comet, it's always named by whoever discovered the comet. And since most comets are discovered by satellites now, they're named after the satellite that discovered them. Um, if you, um, so, you know, various things are still getting named, uh, but the old Greek and Greek legends are still very popular. Now, John, were you able to pull up the cultural references? Yes, I have. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing for a second here, John. Uh, dazzle them, please. Yeah, so we're just going to do a brief, I'm not going to give you a tour, but just to show you an example, this is the Navajo sky. So they have moose and cranes and loons, different creatures that are relevant in the Navajo world are now in the skies. And they're beautifully painted here. Yeah, so, so within this program Stellarium that we'll talk about, in a few minutes, you can do this. You can switch from all kinds of different uh, cultural references to how they map the stars. Thank you, John. Sure. Okay, Jane, and I think we're through with that. Well, thank you, Alex and John. Uh, and now uh, reporting back to you, John. Okay, so actually now I've got to hurry up and get rid of this Navajo stuff and take us back to... Uh, Western culture, otherwise I'll get all confused. Yeah, yeah. While, we're, while we're at it, and you notice how many he's got to choose from here? Yeah, see that long list. Korean, Locano, Macedonian, Maori, Mongolian. There's a lot. It, it's I, funny, some of them are the same. So, some of them do relate the same. Um, a giant is a giant in several of them and things like that. Uh, but 
no, we're prejudiced to present things from the Western perspective. Um, and that means that we're showing you what the Greeks named it. Anyway, for the last thing we're going to show you up in the sky tonight, remember we talked about Cygnus over here, the swan. Near the head of the swan is Alberio that Jose just talked about. And right next to that is the constellation Vulpecula. Not a particularly large or interesting constellation, but it is where you can find the coat hanger. That's right. You heard me correct. The coat hanger. And that's where Randy's going to come back and show us that little asterism. So Randy? Yes. Um, okay. Let me um, let me answer one question first, if that's okay, Xenon. Yeah, go ahead. There was a question about they want to buy some binoculars tonight, at, uh, probably off of Amazon or whatever, 11 by 80s or 7 by 50s. Uh, if you've never done this thing before, I would recommend 7x50s. They're heavy enough. Uh, they usually have a way to put them on a tripod. Um, and uh, they're very good all around general use. They're really the best sort of night vision without using electronics. 11x80s are nice also, but they're greatly, uh, you know, two, three, four times expensive. And they're heavy. And their field of view is a little bit narrower. Um, they're great if you kind of know what you're doing. Uh, they're kind of more of a specialty binoculars. Um, but I would recommend, if you've never done this before, 7x50s would probably be the ultimate one for night vision. But do realize, even those will start feeling heavy. Uh, let me go on to see if I can share my screen. And uh, pull up. I guess I could sort of entitle this, <laughs> is there a celestial coat hanger in your future? Let me see if I can get some stuff out of the way here. John, can you see that un, sort of uh, unpopulated? I see a coat hanger. Okay, very good. Now, one of the things that has been mentioned earlier is when you look into the sky, you look at constellations or asterisms, you're not going to see exactly what they are. A stick figure, uh, line kind of thing is really basically the best that you're going to see. The uh, All of these objects that you've shown tonight actually are pretty cool to see with binoculars. And binocular astronomy, whether you're a beginner or advanced, it doesn't matter. I always take one with me every all the time. Uh, I would recommend at least a 30 millimeter, that's a little bit over an inch wide lens in the front, or bigger. Uh, newer stuff is lighter, older stuff is cheap but it's also a little bit heavier. Do you want to see this one? This one is a very, this one's a fun one to find. This one's pretty neat. Uh, let me move off to one frame. How do you find it? Well, uh, right now sinking in the sky, we have what's left of our summer triangle, which is the Deneb, this uh, um, brightest star in Cygnus, Altar, uh, the brightest star in Aquila, and uh, Vega, the brightest star in Lyra make a big triangle here and it's along this uh, line here part of the way down. There's actually an easier way of finding it than that and I, I drew this in. Go down to the um, Alberio Jose was just showing. By the way, Alberio has an unofficial nickname called UCLA Double. In all my years of doing amateur astronomy, I've never had anybody complain except for people from USC. For some reason they get upset with that. Anyways, you take uh, start at Alberio and you go to the brightest star in Vulpecula, which is pretty easy to see. It's about as if this is a clock and that's 12 o'clock high and you kind of come around, it's about seven o'clock. You can usually see that one. That also has a nickname. It's called the false Alberio. You will see um, uh, gold and blue, just like you see gold and blue with Alberio, except these are a little bit wider apart. They're both pretty cool to see, but this one you'll definitely split with binoculars. Anyways, you follow this line that they make about the distance to either one of these arms here. And you'll land up and it'll end up kind of looking upside down the coat hanger. Now the coat hanger is a true asterism. These are not a constellation. They're not grouped together. They just by pure chance happen to be a group of stars, about 10 stars that happen to look like a old fashioned coat hanger. They range anywhere from about 200 light years away to about a little over a thousand, about 1100 light years away. 
and they are not associated with each other and don't have anything to do with each other. Over time, this will drift apart and this won't look like this. It'll take a few thousand years. So, you know, you need to get your binoculars out there and look at them relatively soon. Um, this is what you would see in my backyard right now tonight, if the clouds weren't there, uh, through binoculars, maybe just slightly smaller than this. Uh, I was able to find, and I wish I could get, put the person's name down, there's a drawing here that an amateur astronomer made using a pair of 10 by 50, 10 power with a 50 millimeter lens in the front, just about two inches and in, uh, across on the lens. And he drew this, this is pretty much what you'd see. Some other uh, stars uh, nearby. Um, actually, it's quite uh, an interesting object to take a look at. If you wanted to draw lines together, well, in this picture here, it's a little bit better one. Uh, you can see that the, most of these stars are kind of whitish color and out of the 10, about seven of them. And then there's three that have a kind of a yellowish, orangish color. Again, if you have a um, $10,000 of a telescope and uh, camera equipment, you can get like this picture, astronomy picture of the day where you can see the, the, see the, um, the coat hanger along with uh, all the background uh, stars in our own galaxy. However, with binoculars, you're not going to come anything near as nice, as beautiful as this is, but it still doesn't take away. It's still a lot of fun to see it. This, this here, I rotated the camera 90 degrees so that the coat hanger was looking somewhat right side up. But when you see it with your binoculars, it's going to pretty much look kind of uh, upside down. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Xenon or John. Xenon. Great. Um, so we have uh, a couple other quick questions here. Um, one is um, from uh, Marisa B asking uh, if we have any upcoming events. And we do. Uh, we will probably take a break in December and return in January um, with possibly a moon theme that we're, we're going to offer a tour of the moon. Um, and there is another question uh, from uh, Gerardo Lopez asking how many stars are visible from the Earth? Oh, I'll take that, Zena. Um, I am sharing my screen right now, and my screen should, that's just my desktop screen. It's a picture that I took in uh, Devil's Tower, where if you're old enough to remember Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that's where the spaceship landed, okay? Um, but you can see how many stars there are here. And the answer to your question is, it depends. It depends on where you are, what the weather is. Right now, Randy's kind of a little upset because after all the practicing he did, he can see no stars because the clouds are there. Besides that, he's in Riverside where there's a lot of light pollution. And so even on a good night, he might be able to see only about 50 different special stars. Whereas if you were out here on the night that I was taking this picture of um, of the Milky Way and stuff, you could see thousands of them. Um, most people consider the brightest or the dimmest star you can see is what's called the sixth magnitude star. Um, there, are, it's just a measurement of the brightness of the star, kind of like wattage. And believe me, a sixth magnitude is not a very bright star. There are about nine thousand of them. And if you're young and have big eyes, you can see about 9,000 stars in the sky. That's the possibility of seeing them. Of course, you can't see them all at once because you can, you know, you're, the, the sky's only so big. So um, if you're out in some place like this, you might be able to see a thousand sky stars or, or 1500 or 2000 stars. If you're in Riverside right now or, or in a big city, you might be able to see a dozen stars. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Alex and John. I think now we can wrap up. All right. So I want to share with you. Uh oh. So now can you talk for a minute while I get the one I need up here? Oh, yeah, totally. Um, I guess there is uh, another quick question while you're pulling things up uh, from a wandering teacup asking uh, what are each of your favorite constellations? I guess we are not gonna be able to like go around and uh, 
you know, say that, but if anyone wants to quickly jump in and share while John is pulling up the, the pages. My, my favorite is Orion because it's my son's favorite. And every time when I first see it, I, I think of my son. Well, that's also my favorite. There's a lot of other reasons Orion's cool, but. Yeah, and it's so easy to spot in a, in a uh, fall slash winter sky, you know, with yeah. the Orion spelt, those are three stars in a line. And uh, you're also able to, with, with a par pair of binoculars, be able to see the Orion Nebula. Right. You know, another thing uh, I was, uh, um, since nobody else is answering what their favorite constellation is, I want to go back to the question about how do you start learning um, your constellations? Um, learn one constellation find one that you know for instance the big dipper which isn't a constellation but it's a good place to start or the one we were talking about tonight cassiopeia it, it, you look north it's the big w or the big m depending on which way you're looking at it up in the sky and use a planisphere or a a star map to use the stars to point to other constellations so, and then after you've learned that other constellation, now you've got two constellations you can use. Orion is particularly good at this because the three belt stars point to one constellation. Uh, Betelgeuse points to another constellation. Uh, I mean, the, from the, from the uh, Rigel to Betelgeuse points to another constellation. I can't remember what they all are, but that's a very good way to try to, to track out what the rest of the constellations are. Thank I will you, volunteer. Alex. I'll volunteer that my favorite constellation, since Orion's already taken, would be Sagittarius. Great summertime constellation. Yeah, I'm changing my mind to Scorpius. Dang. <laughs> you stole that like, from well. me, Alex. Okay. Okay. Jose, explain why it's my favorite constellation. Which one? Scorpius? Whatever. Well, I guess we get I guess we really need to wrap up since we're well, yeah. okay. over time. You guys can have that conversation later. Okay. Okay, boys. Okay, so let me, I'm ready to share. So I want to put in a little plug for my astronomy club, the Riverside Astronomical Society. We're a group of maybe 240 or so people that think astronomy is cool. We are not professional astronomers by any means, but we do some cool stuff. We've got uh, land up in the high desert where it gets nice and dark. You can see the Milky Way, you can set up your telescopes. Um, it's just a cool thing. If, you, if you're Watching us right now at this late hour, you must really like astronomy. So, you know, I would suggest you think about joining an astronomy club. If not, if you don't live in the Riverside area, Google it. And my guess is you'll find an astronomy club near wherever you are. We've been talking tonight about using binoculars for astronomy purposes. And so, of course, if you want to take that to the next step, you might want to get a book. Uh, a couple of excellent books on binoculars here is Touring the Universe Through Binoculars by Phil Harrington, or Binocular Highlights by Gary Saronic. Both excellent books to take out with you with your binoculars as you look up in the sky. There's an excellent book for young children, elementary school age children, all about astronomy called A Child's Introduction to the Night Sky by Michael Driscoll. An excellent introductory book to astronomy for high school students as well as adults is Night Watch by Terrence Dickinson. And this book also has an entire section on how to choose equipment, how to, you know, binoculars, what kind of telescope should you buy, things like that. So a lot of the questions you might have can be addressed right here. There's astronomy magazines. If you want to keep up to date on a month to month basis of how new developments in astronomy, you can get astronomy magazine, get sky and telescope magazine. You can pick those up at Barnes and Noble if you'd like. Now, earlier we were talking about how do you learn constellations? Where do you start? skymaps.com is a great place to start. You go to that website every month, download a new updated map of the sky, and it'll clearly show you which, which constellations are the brightest and easiest to find. Um, so print those out, go outside, look up. Sky Safari is a terrific app for your phones or for your tablets. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the, the app, I, the program I've been using to show you the night sky tonight it's called Stellarium. It's a free download for your computer. If you don't have a computer, if you have like a Chromebook, you can go to their website and use their web-based program. So there's a lot of good resources for you if you want to keep learning more about astronomy.
Great. Thank you, John. And now it's my time for my own plug. So uh, if, you're, if you have been enjoying our events, I would highly recommend that you follow us or like us on uh, the Facebook page we have. Um, just type in uh, Astronomy UC Riverside and you can see that every time we post uh, our upcoming events and also all the news related to UC Astronomy here. So you will never be able to miss one um, if you just follow us and every time, uh, as soon as we schedule uh, things, we're gonna be uh, putting things up here. And of course, um, I guess uh, so some were asking about our um, next event, right? So as I said, uh, we're possibly doing a tour uh, of the moon and we're uh, tentatively thinking about doing it on uh, Thursday, January the 21st. So um, more will be uh, coming soon as we finalize the date, but uh, please stay in tune. Uh, yeah. Um, and any final thoughts there, John, before I- nope. uh, Okay. Nothing else. Great. Okay. So I would like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And as mentioned earlier, we would really appreciate your feedback on our event. Um, and uh, an anonymous survey will be sent to you. Well, you will be filling out the, uh, the survey anonymously. Uh, that will be sent to you this Saturday. And if you could kindly just uh, quickly fill it out, um, spend two to three minutes, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, we do want to know what you like or not like about this event and how we can do better. And you will also have a chance to sign up for our email list uh, in the same survey if you want to be informed of all our future events. So I guess with that, uh, thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us and uh, hope you have a good night. Night everybody. <laughs>